You will not be able to stay home, brother. You will not be able to... Two million, million black victims of Americanism are waking up and they're gaining a new political consciousness, becoming politically mature. And as they become, uh, develop this political maturity, they're able to see the recent trends in these uh, political elections. The any minority that has a block of votes that stick together is in a strategic position. Either way you go, that's who gets it. You're, you're in a position to determine who go to the White House and who stay in the doghouse. You're the one who has that power. You, you and I have never seen democracy. All we've seen is hypocrisy. <laughs> Not through the eyes of someone who has who has enjoyed the fruits of Americanism. We see America through the eyes of someone who has been the victim of Americanism. We don't see any American dream. We've experienced only the American nightmare. We haven't benefited from America's democracy. We've only suffered from America's hypocrisy. And the generation that's coming up now can see it. And I'm not afraid to say 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 it. And I'm and I'm not afraid to say it. And I'm not afraid to say it. And I'm not afraid to say it. Good afternoon. This is Black Westchester. Magazine presents People Before Politics Radio every Sunday, 6 to 8 on InTheMixRadio.com. I am A.J. Woodson, um, your host, along with Damon Jones. Yes, yes. I'm um, not sure if Dr. Bob Baskerville is making an appearance today. Nah, no, he's not coming today. No, That's right. Not, That's right. right. Dr. Right. Bob's not coming Shout today. out to him. He's uh, son graduated. I think he's having a, 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 yes. a, party, a party for them today. So Congratulations, um, Dr. We want to congratulate them if they're listening. Um was we changing the show around a little bit? We had a candidate, um, uh, c- uh, county legislative candidate Christine Peters, that was supposed to appear in the show. They're having a special election Tuesday. You know, I was gonna have her on the show for a half an hour, edit that part of the video, put it on Black Westchester, blast it out for the next couple of days. You know what I'm saying? You know, before the election, but um, we were just told that she cannot come in and. Um, so uh, we're going to move on to the next thing. So, yeah, we have to. So, so we're just going to keep it moving. I'm sorry we like to get the candidates in, but um, you know, and we give you the platform to be here. You need to be here. Yeah, and, well, that, and, that, and that's for every candidate. That that just that's just, there's a lot of people running for office. I mean, if you say you're coming and you come in the studio, don't don't call late and tell me you won't. I call think in. it's you know, um, we we have been running a good record. On candidates that have come on the show that have actually won the elections, actually yes, um, that have come on the show and thir- 13, 13 and one, and 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 I think um, sometimes the candidates are misinformed uh, through their political party chairs and those who control these political parties to tell them not to come on people before politics. Well, this wasn't a chair thing. This was her campaign manager slash press person, well, then, Javon uh, Prince, who said he's pulling her to knock on doors. Well, you that, know, was his, you know, that was uh, well, his response. Well, well, you know, so, I mean, I'm just going to put it where it is. Well, that, that still falls in the understanding yeah. of, of false understanding of, 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 of political party politics and, and not understanding of who actually reaches out to the people and who actually discuss real issues for the people. Um, the campaign manager should have had done his research, you know, to really understand that, you know, it's good to knock on doors, but, you know, uh, you know, in the day and age of social media and Internet, it's also good to come on shows that that uh, that, that reach many people, especially you know? when especially and she's a, and she has an uphill battle because she's actually going against um, someone who worked in. The office of the the, the 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 previous the previous county legislator that retired, and um, from my understanding, even the Independence Party, you know, endorsed her candidate. You know, well, and on top of that, from my research, to date, most Yonkers candidates for that office, Democrats, always lose to the Republican candidate. Um, 
and for that office to date. Like I mean, that's been the pattern. So she she would have been one of the first if she would have been able to pull this out. Um, but you got to you got to walk all those dogs. You got to do everything. But um, right. and, and 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 traditionally, a lot of times the problem with that position, it 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 fills the like Fleetwood area and um. Over to like South Street and High Street and all that, North and South High Street and all that, in Mount Vernon. But a lot of times, it's the Yonkers candidates, and they don't really have Mount Vernon's back. They don't really do a lot for Mount Vernon. So, so up until this point, at your real talk, I thought Lyndon Williams was our only county legislator. And no, no, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, Mount Vernon has two. Well, yeah, Mount yeah but um, that's the only one I've ever seen um, since I've been here. So I didn't know we even had two um, till recently, and. Um, it's a shame, though. So I wish them well, but we're going to move on. And um, as always, this is the second week. Um, also, um, y'all don't know, we just celebrated our uh, two-year anniversary of Black Westchester. And um, officially, it's uh, we're on show, I think, 89 now. And we're at the two-year anniversary of uh, People Before Politics, which is actually was April, I'm sorry, August 3rd, 2014 was our first show. Um, so we're actually at the two year mark for People Before Politics 2 um, we do have an app on its way um, one of the upgrades you can now anybody who follows me on Facebook AJ Woodson you can now watch the show on my page on Facebook Live um, and it's up there now yeah, it's, the it's on, yeah it's on my page also right so yeah so we're going to share it everywhere else right but um so so that's another little angle um, to, to, to get it in um um, I, I just, I just want to say. Um, oh, shout, shout to John R. Jones Jr. who says I'm watching AJ. So he's uh, great, great. That's what's up. Um, where's Brenda Crump? Um, Brenda Crump late. asked us to post something because. Oh, and also uh, we apologize uh, coming in. And we started a uh, good eleven, twelve minutes late today. So um, <laughs> Brenda hit us while we was in the car. I told him I post that post on people before politics. Oh, so okay. she's she, she's the waiting for the post. Oh, okay. Brenda, if you're listening, it's I'm, on I'm my po- page. I'm gonna post it right now. All right, I'm, we're gonna we're gonna yeah we're gonna share the share uh, the link. Share um, the Nichelle Johnson says I'm watching and listening. Also, AJ, Judge Nichelle Johnson running for, uh, to keep her seat um, for a city court judge in Mount Vernon. That's what's up. That's so, what's up, Nichelle. Um, anybody else? Like you said, so, you know, Facebook hit us with a shout out. You know what I'm saying? Well, we we we're, we're gonna have a good conversation. We're definitely gonna have. Um, Daniel Buford's in the house tonight, and he was on the. He called in um, yes, yes, a couple yes. of months ago, yes. and he he really laid it out on where we are at black people in the justice system, as far as taking it to the United Nations, and um and 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 how does that help us, and how does that bring awareness to the injustice of of black people throughout the United States in this injustice system. And we're going to get into that. And we also have a um, friend of the show, our sister, powerful sister. Absolutely, I, absolutely. Know, um, Sandy, I'm all, I am always mess your name. Barnaby. But not. But I said it right? Did I say it right? She said it right. Yeah, I, I said it right this time because she corrected me last time. Because <laughs> like, like, I think I was saying Bernard would be or something. Like I was saying, right. yeah. How many years do you have to be friends before you get it right? <laughs> but, you know. You know, it's one of those things, but I've only seen it and never heard it said. So I, you know, I never had a reference to go to. So, but but but, but I want. She has been a friend of the show, not only a friend of the show, but she has been a friend of mine and and a supporter. And um, you know, a lot of times, you know, I get I get labeled, you know, all type of names, you know. But we gotta understand justice. There's no color in justice. You know, justice is clear. It's supposed to be. You know, it, 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 it's supposed to be. And um, Sandy has been a supporter, you know, when when other people haven't supported. You know, Sandy has said, you know, have talked to me on the phone and encouraged me to continue to do what I do, even though um, there have been some people that have attacked me and and whatever. And Mm -hmm. and she has been a definitely supporter. And she also taught me that laughter is a thing to 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 really. Help me through a lot of situations where um, either I'm misunderstood or they are making me misunderstood. You know, so mm-hmm. I'm glad to have her on the show and, and, I, and have her back on the show. And I want to say, I want to say two things. First off, 
Um, shout to we just met with some new advertisers today, and um, once they put that check, I'll give you their names. But um, <laughs> but, but you know, also we have that. You know, one of the things we created, a lot of people couldn't afford the mom, the, a lot of mom and pop stores couldn't afford three, four, five hundred dollars a month. You know, to advertise as a banner ad, or a full page ad, or a sidebar ad. So we we created a business directory classified section. It's the last tab on the front page of Black Westchester, and it's. Three hundred dollars for the year. That's twenty five dollars a month. I right. mean that that for we made it businesses. for small businesses. This is not for your big corporations. This is for small businesses and organizations. And you know, while a lot of my brothers and sisters have um, championed us and um, given us praise and props and all kinds of things to keep us going and talked about how worthy it was. Actually, it was the first few people to write checks or send money were not all our brothers and sisters. <laughs> it's Frank Trusco from, from Frank Trusco. From Trusco. Big, big shout out to Frank. Sandy Trusco. from the That's Anti-Racist right. Alliance. That's um, right. Frank Strand. Um, right. So, so I'm just saying. So it's like we. It's funny because you know our brothers and sisters, and I can put it out there. You know, what I mean, you know, you got to support black business. You you want us to keep doing the things that we do. Um, you got you got to support it. You know what I'm saying? It costs us to, to to keep this going. We've been doing it for two years. We're trying to go to the next level. We're trying to be more effective and cover more of the issues. Be able to bring on more writers. You know what I'm saying? So we can be, have people at different events and stuff. And 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 um, you know, one way to help keep that going. Like I said, it's three hundred dollars. That's twenty five dollars a month. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, you got to figure, yo, is your business worth twenty five dollars a month? Like, I mean, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, and and you get the page, and it's a directory thing, and go look at it. You know what I'm saying? You could pull it up by city or by, you know, whatever the category is. Click on bakery, cupcake cutie, and a bunch of other bakeries will pop up. You know what I'm saying? If you click construction, Andre's company, and Trusco will come up. You know, just and you you do it by city too. So it's a good directory tool. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to put that out there, but I just want to shout, Sandy was one of our first um, advertisers. You know what I'm saying? First one. A lot of people say, yo, I want to do it. I want to do it. As Frank, Frank Trusco said, how much? Oh, are you going to be at the city council meeting tonight? And then I looked across the room. He said, AJ, and he held up an envelope. And I went over and picked it up three hours later. <laughs> Sandy said, how much? And she paid per PayPal. But I'm just like, later. You know, yeah. sometimes we got to pull teeth. I have had some of my brothers and sisters who have come to me for six months to tell me they're advertising and wouldn't tell me to come to the store on Thursday, and they left their checkbook um, that day. And you know who you are. So, so um, anyway, we're before just we get on. before we get to our guests, real quick, Sam Rivers is on the um, check in and um, some. What's up, Sam? Um, before we get to, we also Black Westchester. Um, we sent out an email blast, um, and you could go on our page, blackwestchester.com. dot com. Um, I know you, a lot of people saw the shirts that I've been wearing um, with 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 the ball face with the glasses on it. We are uh, selling those shirts to raise money for a mentoring program starting in September. You know, a lot of people talk about we talk about this, we talk about that, but we don't talk about what we're doing in the community. So, um, the Boys the Men program. That a lot of people have been seeing, we have been taking them on different trips. Yes, and we want to continue to take them on trips. So it's about it's about raising money, and um, we're going to post. Um, we, we're definitely going to post the site. It's on teespring.com. Um, you could go to Black Westchester nine one four collection, and thirty um, percent of all proceeds made from selling to the t-shirts is going to go to the program and and to to help to take the kids on trips. We want to expand their minds. You know. One of the biggest things, one of the most exciting things that happened to them last year, when we took him to the county exec's office, and yes, they all yes, got certificates yes. from the county exec. Yes. And he sat down and he and he talked to him. And, and you can see that on Black West. Yeah, too. and you can see that on Black West. He, he shared his story about. Oh, it you know, was great. Things it, in know, his life that made different moves and right. and how he got to be in the politics. And it wasn't an about Republican and Democrat. It was yeah. just about expanding our our children's minds so they could they could actually think that they could achieve. To be whatever they want to be, and and that's what and that's what we have to start doing, and and we have to start, you know, it's it's not about talking about how the system is is always against us. It's about how do we educate our youth to be to be excellent, you know. And and I put I posted on my Facebook page, you know, um, you can't fight racism with ignorance. You can fight racism with excellence. 
Absolutely. And, 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 and that's what we want to teach in our children to be excellent in whatever they do in life, to be to be excellent at that. So so um, help us out. The shirts is only twenty two dollars. You know, at, you know, the shirts is only twenty two dollars and and thirty percent of the proceeds is going to help us um, continue our efforts with the boys and men program at Cecil Parker um, in, in, in Mount Vernon. So you know what, you know what? So so let's keep it moving. So for the month of August, in the classified section, it's three hundred dollars to advertise. If you advertise in the month of August, thirty percent of all of of that will go to the same program too. So you have to advertise in the month of August. So right. holler at us okay, if you want let's to support make that this. Happen. You know what I'm saying? So, so we'll put our, put, our, put our money where our mouth is, too. And, and let me give you, we got another shout-out. Don't see this one often. Uh, Montika Jones gave us a, a, a little smiley face. Oh, get out of here. Smiley face. Might be because we said Cupcake Cutie. <laughs> I don't know. She gave us a little smiley face with the laughing part. But shout-out to Montika. She's obviously listening. You know? And um, Sandra Fuller. Um, yeah, Sandra Fuller. And there's two other people. I'm trying to get y'all. We're trying to do the shout out thing, you know what I'm saying? So, appreciate all of y'all for tuning in. Um, wait, I have to read this before. Huh? Oh, no. Uh, we was asked a question. <laughs> I had to read it on here before because of the person. Well, I wanted to read it on here before I read it on the air. Um, Mr. Rivers had a question for us. Oh, no. Yeah, so we're going to see if we can get to that later. We're going to deal with some other stuff, Sam, but right. we're going to see if we so, can get to that later. All right, it's, it's He wants to know now. who our special guest is, so I'm going to let you introduce again. Right. Um, I want to give him his own applause. Yes, Go yes, ahead. definitely. Say, say his name. Oh, oh, Brother Daniel Bruford, Reverend Daniel Bruford. Okay. Uh, uh, well, you going to give the applause? <laughs> the official round of applause. I was waiting for him to say something else. He was like, I was waiting for him to say, I want to give you your full official friend yeah but we're gonna let him i mean he has you know he has his resume here but you know i wanted to come from him because he called he he was a guest on the show earlier er, earlier this year i believe it it was earlier this year um he called in but um we are honored to have him actually here on the show and and what he was discussing is where are we in in government sanctioned killings of black men and and how does that and how do we bring this forth um, to the United Nations, to the world, to, for the world to understand what black people are, uh, are actually going through. And um, f- on that note, I just want to um, welcome Brother Buford here, man, and it's an honor to have you here. And the floor, and the floor is yours. And oh, well, well don't, don't give me the whole floor. Just give me a little <laughs> And, and, and put, make sure you pull the mic up. And just for anybody, he was on episode 48. Which was, yeah, was, which was yeah, which was uh, when Judge Armstrong and Councilman Richard Thomas, who were both campaigning, were on the show that day. So I'm posting that on there so y'all can check out the other show too. Okay. Go ahead. All right. My name is Daniel Buford. Some people call me Reverend Daniel Buford. I'm here from Oakland, California. I'm a member and minister at the Allen Temple Baptist Church in East Oakland, Oakland, California. I'm, I work in the so-called kill zone of, uh, of of Oakland and um, live in West Oakland, uh, a place that is a black community that is disintegrating under the um, onslaught of gentrification and um, people from Google and other places buying up property around where I live. So, mm. so our community, w- everywhere it is, is, uh, is under some kind of a threat or under some kind of attack or under some kind of a siege. And so um, I share that characteristic with people here in New York and everywhere else where we are where we're in captivity Um, so uh, my name is Daniel and of course there's a person in the Bible named that and so I'm named after that person as well as my grandfather and great grandfather I'm an African American who's also a Native American and so my people were here already when white people came here and stole my other people and brought he- them to work the land that they <laughs> stole from my other folk. So I got a chip on two shoulders. I got That's a chip right. on the red shoulder and I got a chip on the black That's shoulder. Right. That's right. So uh, you will hear some of that this evening. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about the work that I've been doing to, uh, to raise the uh, awareness of everyone who is a human being about the human rights of every human being. But since my entry point into humanity and being a human being is being a black human being, uh, then it's certainly uh, my interpretation of humanity has to come from the lens of my experience of a black mm-hmm. person as a human being. 
I'm stressing my humanity because a lot of people are talking about Black Lives Matter and they talk about the blackness matters and true and our lives matter and that's certainly true but uh, there are all kinds of life forms that are black that live and that matter what uh, what distinguishes us from all other black life forms that matter is that we're black human life forms that mm. matter Wow! and it's our humanity that makes our black life matter and if we could get people to see our humanity uh, then they would be able to see their own humanity and thus they would be able to reflect on why wow. black lives matters is because if black life doesn't matter then no human life matters mm. so then black lives matters then to me uh, is a reminder of uh, us always putting in the face of the world that, uh, that it's our humanity that counts. W.B. Du Bois um, said that to be a, a, a black person or a Negro in the United States is to continually be confronted with the question of what, is it, what does it mean to be the problem? Everybody has problems, mm -hmm. but you know, what is it like to be the problem? And that's what we have been faced with uh, since we've been here. So I'm here to um, uh, continue on something that uh, I didn't start. I've been a part of uh, for most of my life, but I, I couldn't claim to start it. Um, but uh, I'm certainly, uh, this is my turn now in my generation. I'm influenced by, uh, by, my, by Malcolm X. I'm, a, I'm influenced by Paul Robeson. I'm in influenced by W.B. Du Bois because they are the ones that really were the first ones that brought, and William Patterson, who brought a, a, a petition before the United Nations in the early 1950s that is now enshrined in a book called We Charge Genocide. And my work in, uh, in research is, uh, is in, in patterned after uh, that work. So what is that work? I did research last year looking at unarmed African Americans encounters with police from 1970 to 2015 and in looking at that as my research field I was looking at uh, instances of unarmed African Americans and instances where I could detect uh, cruel and unusual punishment instances where I could detect uh, false uh, arrest and, and uh, uh, searches and seizures, instances where I could uh, detect um, unequal protection of the laws. And then I matched those uh, situations up with uh, international law and international bodies of law and um, developed a, a list and then a, a way to talk about these killings and these uh, murders that are happening to our people in the context of human rights language. If I may, uh, to make the distinction of what I mean about human rights language. Yeah, and I also want you, um, can you make a distinction when you're talking about what's the difference between national laws and international laws? Right. Um, well, <clears throat> the national laws are the laws uh, uh, that have to do with the Constitution. So um, the national law that I'm talking about is the U.S. Constitution, the, uh, the laws of the states, the laws of the muni municipalities within the United States. The international law has to do with treaty relationships and treaty obligations that the United, ha United States has with international bodies like the United Nations, Organization of American States, and the World Court, and the Geneva Convention. So there are uh, the domestic laws and international laws. We in the United States think, for instance, that when people talk about human rights and human rights violations and human rights laws, that that's something that applies from the outs, from uh, from looking at other people. That's other people's problem, you know, mm -hmm. OPP, you know. Right. So that's some other people's stuff. So uh, when they think of human rights <laughs> problems with the police, um, they call it if 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 we see people in 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 Turkey getting whipped in the head by Turkish police. The, new, the U.S. media would say that that would be a human rights violation. Right. If we saw that in, uh, in any Middle Eastern or Asian country or African country or Latin American country and uniformed people uh, take the streets with uh, weapons and machine guns and, and dogs and so on, we would say that there's a military occupation 
uh, repression of the community and the people's human rights are being repressed and violated. Uh, but I grew up seeing that here in the United States, mm. uh, having uh, our communities occupied by the police and occupied by the uh, National Guard and everyone else. So then I, th I think that we have to develop language that calls it what it is. Now here's what I mean by human rights language uh, and the national sense and why we need to uh, fit it a different way. Uh, you know that the um, United States, we have their, our own way of measuring stuff. We don't measure feet or yards or inches the way that the international <laughs> world does, right? The world deals with the metric system, right, right. and we deal with the Uncle Sam system because you know we <laughs> Americans and we can do what the hell we want to do with measurement. So, so then we grew up running the fifty-yard dash, while in Europe they were running the fifty-meter. We we grew up running the hundred-yard dash, and they running what they running in the uh, Olympics with the hundred meter. What I'm saying here is that the United States has different ways of measuring stuff than the rest of the world. That's right. And our rights, particularly our human rights and our humanity, is no exception. Mm. So then the United States uh, measurement for what happens to our people when it's talking about in the news media, they may say, well, this is a case of, of an officer-involved shooting. And uh, an officer-involved shooting uh, certainly could be anything. It could be a, a cop getting drunk and shooting off some rounds into the air on New Year's. That's an offensive involved shooting. Uh, uh, he's uh, cleaning his service revolver and the thing, or, or his automatic, <laughs> and uh, so I don't use a six shooter no more. Uh, um, and uh, the thing fall on the floor, and right. you know and that right. could be an officer involved shooting. But there's different different way in the uh, international community when the officer involved shooting involves somebody getting killed and murdered. They call it, if you get shot in the head two times in the front and in the back and the side of the neck, that's a summary execution. Wow. And some of these killings of black people by the cops have been in the head and the side of the neck and it's been women who have been shot in the head and in the side of the neck. More on that later. Mm. So uh, that's not just an officer involved shooting that's a summary execution we ought to call it what it is it's not only an officer involved shooting but it might be an arbitrary killing they just mm. arbitrarily killed you for something that ain't even a capital punishment offense like crossing the street wrong or right. selling right. cigarettes uh, the right. tax, <laughs> or you know, not paying your traffic ticket, or right. or you get about Selling to be CDs on the or, side of the or road. you about yeah. to be evicted, and so right. that's extrajudicial punishment. They're going beyond the law to punish you, and so then they, the in the international community has words that are a lot stronger than the words that we use to characterize these things. And so what I did was, as I did research, that I'll share with you in a moment, uh, and I'll read these these names. And, uh, and see how you feel about it, uh, what the difference would be if these were just called like an officer-involved shooting or you call it a summary execution or arbitrary punishment right. or arbitrary killing. It has right. a different flavor to right. it. That's right. right. That's you, you, you had a question you wanted to ask? No, me? man. I'm just, I'm just in it, man. <laughs> I'm just, we, we all, <laughs> go ahead. I'm just, I'm, I'm just in it because I'm going to steal some of your stuff now. I'm going right. to tell you right now. <laughs> all right, man. Well, uh, well you can... Wait, but aren't you with a, p a policeman? <laughs> I'm correction. Oh, well, I'm oh. not that. I'm not your normal uh, law enforcement. I, I can see. I can see that now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll be right after. I'm, I'm kind of. Uh, I'm. I'm kind of that cat that's on the outside screaming foul all the time. All right, well, we might have to arm wrestle about you stealing my stuff. So, uh, let's, let's see what's, what's happening. I'm like, man, I'm in class right yeah. now. So, so check. So check this out. I want to. I want to share with you um, some stuff. And we're in an area that um, Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton uh, are familiar with, aren't they? That's in terms right. of where we they, live. They, they, and this their, is their home. They, this uh, is their adopted hometown. Well, you know what people, before I get into my list, um, yeah, I know that people have a lot of feelings about, uh, you know, Clinton, the Clintons, you know, what they did and what he did and what he didn't do and all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the fact is, Bill Clinton is the only president that signed executive order for those of you who are paying attention 13107 implementation of human rights treaties on December 10th 1998 by doing that he made it so that the United States government is supposed to 
obey and report on the um, the human rights issues that are going on and those that are uh, responsible under different federal jurisdictions. This is important because this opened up the way for domestic groups to file human rights reports against the United States. Really? In oh. New York and Switzerland. Yeah. Okay. So it, it did that. <laughs> oh, man. But we don't know that. That's <laughs> See, we don't know that. That's right. You know, the same way that, that people were on uh, Hillary Clinton about, well, you know, you voted for that war. But people don't remember that her husband left a peace dividend from the way that he did the economy. So there was so much money left over when, when Bill Clinton got out that um, <clears throat> Bush was able to prosecute two wars with that money. Mm -hmm. So people forget that um, really they were building up not a war chest money, but money for like a new deal. Now, that mm -hmm. didn't happen. Well, but I'm just saying that ain't nobody else going to be in the White House and we can say, look, when your husband was in the office, he said that you could file human rights complaints. And the right. United States government had to report on human rights stuff. Right. You know, we can't say that with, with the guy with the yellow hair, you know, and, and <laughs> stuff. So, you, you know, so... Um, so you can't do that. So, so I'm just saying there's an opportunity, right? You know whether right. you whether you like her or not. The right. opportunity is, is if you that. don't like her, then hold her re responsible, responsible for what her husband said about being able to file human rights, right? And I right. Think, and I think she would like that, and right? Probably he would too. Now, um, getting back to what my my research uh, field is, and this is what I want to focus on. Um, you know, um, a spear. Um, a, a spear, the way a spear is designed, uh, the, the smallest part is the is the tip of the spear. But um, but if you were to measure it per weight, it's the heaviest part. So mm -hmm. actually, the heaviest part of the sp of the spear is the smallest part. Okay. Because the weight is concentrated at the right. tip, even though the shaft might even be longer or heavier than that. But it's it's all concentrated in the tip. We have to concentrate the force and the power and the mass and the force of the power and the weight and the force of the power of the moral argument about why our lives matters. Mm -hmm. Because too many people have jumped into the Black Lives Matters issue and, and they don't, they didn't, our lives didn't matter in nothing until George Soros put up some money for people to talk about it. <laughs> you know, but I matter, our lives should matter anyway. Right. And if he got money to tell some young people that our lives matter, he need to put some money into some houses so some people can build some stuff and have some contracts right. and do some stuff. Because right. he's making money off of us just like everybody else. Right. So we got to look at how do we keep young white people who are in an anarchy from stealing our message and making it so that black, the Black Lives Matter slogan is nothing but a nuisance when people hear it. Right. And so I'm concerned about that. Right. Uh, I'm like the dealer who's been on the, the corner slinging rocks for years, and now you come up and set up uh, selling some, um, some, some joints. <laughs> I, you got to deal with me because I've been here. What am I saying? I've been in the peace and justice movement for four decades. You don't come up like a mushroom growing overnight talking about Black Lives Matters and then destroying Oakland, which is a city of black people, and you don't live in it as if that, that causes that. Right. So right. I, I'm, 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 right. I'm hot about that. So, so now. Rightly so. So here's what I'm saying. Let's focus the moral weight now, they're usually able to, the cops are able to defend shootings of black men mm. with the Scalia excuse. The Scalia excuse is, well, the cop, all, the only thing that's important in a police shooting, an officer-involved shooting, is the officer's state of mind. And if the officer's state of mind says that he feared for his life or he had reasonable re uh, 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 expectation of a threat to come to him, then he is in his right to exercise to, uh, to save and protect his life. So, so, so a cop's fear is enough to, to bring the death penalty in a case. Uh, and nobody else's fear gives them a mandate to kill anybody but, but cops. So then, so then I'm going to read off some cases. A lot of times, you know, when you hear about a brother, he's un unarmed and you know, and you say, well, he was running away from him. He said, yeah, but that was he, his fear. Yeah, you know, and <laughs> so the, the the brother was running away. Said, yeah, but his but every time he would run, one of his arms would come by, down by his side. 
And the cop was and, scared. Yeah, the cop was scared. And then when he'd run the other side, a uh, hand would come down to the other side. And I thought that the next time he came down to the side, he was going to reach it. You know what? Uh, this stupid stuff. So, so then they use that. So let's come up with some cases where they can't say that. We know they shouldn't be saying it anyway, right? Well, let's come up with some cases that say, if you were afraid in this case, you need to give up your badge. A car girly. You you need to you mm -hmm. you need to you need to give up your your position in the police. That's right. And if you're a man, you need to go back and and, and learn how to be a man. And if you're a woman, you need to learn how That's to right. be a woman. And if you're a human being, you need some home training. That's because right. This ain't showing it. So now we need to we need to be smart and intelligent. So here here's the tip of the spear. And this is the heaviest thing of the Black Lives Matters thing. And this is what I want all your listeners to think about right now, is that we're going to talk about missing ingredients. And, you know, some of us eat and some of us cook, but we all know when something's missing That's right. in the mix, right? Mm -hmm. So what's missing in the mix of talking about these uh, police killings by, the, by everybody is, uh, is, is this. What is happening to black women and black girls at the hands of police? That's right. What is happening at the hands of police to unarmed women? Right. I mean, they don't even have to be unarmed black women. I'm going to focus on unarmed black women, but somebody uh, needs to raise a question about why are police overreacting to unarmed women of any race? Absolutely. Right. And if you, un if you overreact to an unarmed woman, what does that say about you, not only in your, tra your training, but what does that say you in terms of the content of your character? That's right. Now, so my research, the per it, 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 it spanned 1970 to 2015. Uh, the first uh, cases that I could find for women uh, started up in 1982. I'm going to read maybe about seven or eight of these, right? And um, then afterward, I want you to just tell me what your visceral, your gut reaction is to hear and these cases and the circumstances surrounding them. <clears throat> Delois Young, pregnant, 1982, Los Angeles, California, survived from being shot during false police raid. Eight-month-old fetus died. This was an arbitrary punishment and killing, extrajudicial punishment and killing. Eleanor Bumper, 66 mm. years old, October 1985, New York, New York cause of death two shotgun blasts from police searching eviction or serving eviction orders extrajudicial punishment arbitrary killing summary execution darnisha harris mm. 16 years old 2002 louisiana death by police gunshots arbitrary killing summary execution Arber alberta spruel 57 years old may 30th 2003 new york new york cause of death heart attack from shock of flash grenade attack on her house which was the wrong address police told media they thought the house was an arsenal of guns drugs and attack dogs torture and arbitrary killing Katherine Johnson 92 years old November 2006 shot five to six times handcuffed as she lay dying no medical treatment while police planted false narcotics evidence in her home torture and summary execution Riora Askew, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, mental patient, shot five times, twice in the back by police, extrajudicial punishment, summary execution. Tarika Wilson, 26 years old, January 4, 2008, Lima, Ohio, killed by police bullets as she held her one-year-old baby who survived but had a finger am amputated. Five children under 10 years old left without a mother arbitrary killing in the summary execution. I'm going to read two more and then three more and then I'm going to stop. Star Brown pregnant, 2009 Baltimore, Maryland, survived beating slammed on the face slammed on face to pavement this is arbitrary detention and extrajudicial punishment and torture Sophia Salva, pregnant Kansas City, Missouri, 2009 survived after being denied medical help by the police as she tried to get to a hospital. She pleaded to be allowed to go to a hospital but was refused. The baby died and miscarried. Arbitrary punishment and torture. The last one that, that I'll read right here which isn't the last of my list Ayanna Stanley Jones, seven years old, May 16, 2010, Detroit, Michigan. Police SWAT team filming an episode of First 48 Hours attacked the wrong address, 
shot a flash grenade, ignited the child's blanket. The lead officer killed her with a single shot. Arbitrary punishment, extrajudicial killing. How, how many? How many more are on your list? Oh. 140. Oh, I was going to ask you to read the whole list, but never no, mind. You don't, you don't want to go there. <laughs> I'm, I'm just reading the ones that I'm saying uh, that are the, I'm saying it's indefensible. I haven't even gotten into the men, you know. But uh, but I started this list um, this way to intentionally because usually uh, when it's one of us, you mm -hmm. know, like for instance, the, there's one on here that's 92, Katherine Johnson's. Well, let's say that Katherine Johnson was a was a male. And she was 29, and he's 29. Now, all of a sudden, well, maybe they needed to shoot the brother. <laughs> right, you know, right, and me, and right. We might even think that way. Right. But she's right. 92, right. and she's a woman. Right. Where, where was that at? Was, um, that was in Georgia. That was the one in Georgia. Yeah. They kicked in her door because I was living in Georgia. They had the wrong address. She was yo, She had a shotgun. They came through the door. She shot because she didn't know who was kicking out her door. And then they they took out. They smoked. Uh, and they had, but they had the. And they had the. Allegedly, she shot. Yeah. I'm not. Yeah. Well, you know, they all they always say what she got. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. But um, the bottom line, they came through the door yeah. blasting. Like mm -hmm. I mean, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? And they didn't even have the right. She lived by herself. And and, she, and it was she, the wrong address. It was the wrong address. She lived yeah. by herself. She'd yeah. been there for years. Yeah. Now now on that wrong address point, in in my research, what I found was okay after uh, looking at. From 1970 to 2015, I uh, covered 140 cases. They weren't the only cases, right? But they were the ones I could find at the time. But then, so I, I looked at them longitudinally, but then I started looking at, well, wait a minute. There's categories of these cases. You notice that there was some repeat stuff. A number of pregnant women. What's up with that? A number of old people. What's up with that? A number of people who were minors. So these are categories. Not only are these categories, but how people die in terms of where they tortured and where they, how they, where they were shot. So what I'm thinking is, is that when we talk about these things, we need to, when I'm talking about us, mm -hmm. uh, that we need to now look at them the way that they are. They're not just individual cases. They're part of a category of a list of, of abuses. For instance, Tamir Rice was the 13-year-old young man that got Cleveland. shot in Cleveland. He had the toy gun right. in his hand in a state that is an open carry yeah, state, right. which, which means that if you're white in, in Cleveland, then, uh, then you can have an open carry of a gun and bullets in it, and you are safe. But if you're a, a kid like him in a playground with a toy gun, then your life can be threatened. But he's not the only black child that's been killed like that. There was a, kill, a kid in uh, Arkansas that was killed under those circumstances. There was a young uh, Latino boy in California killed under those circumstances. There was a, a the the man 22 who was trying to buy a BB gun in the right. Walmart and was shot. And uh, and then they they shot him. Mm -hmm. And then you didn't know about the other killing in that case where there was a woman in the store that was trying to get away from them who died of a heart attack. Really? When after they shot the brother, you know, in in they Mal, never in Mal, about you know they didn't talk about that. So then we. We need to see that uh, that there's things that, that we need to call out. You you know what? Have you ever heard of something called chest compression asphyxia? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. what, 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 what is it for? Our is that from applying too much pressure on on the on the chest? Right, yeah. Right. So so the way that, that that applies to this particular conversation, we know about the chokehold, right? Mm -hmm. You can get choked with a with, with people's fingers with mm -hmm. a, with with an arm lock. You can put a, a stick against their neck and crush their uh, their windpipe. There's you can do a, long, a lot of ways to choke people. And there's another way to uh, take their breath away that police use all over the country, and it's dog piling on people. Right, well, Lay, laying right on top of the person right. until like a boa constrictor, a python. Yeah, you, you have five or six people that weigh 250 pounds <laughs> to 300 pounds each. That person on the bottom will because the pressure. Of all those officers will push down, mm -hmm. and he and and he won't he won't able to breathe. There have been some times where where correction officers get hurt themselves because everybody pile on, and mm -hmm. and and the officer that's on the bottom get hurt. Yeah. So so yeah, well, so, and, and, so yeah, and, that's and, that's and so this happens position. and this that's happens dangerous. like I'm gonna read Sharice Francis, 29, March 15, 2012, New York, New York, mental mental patient shot. 
the death, the a mental patient whose death was from chest compression asphyxia. The police died piled on her, mm. and so like like she's not the only one to die like that. Just like the guy who had his neck broken, he wasn't the only one in that city that died that way. So we need to talk about these cases. As the first time right. I heard about that, right. but it was from it was from actually the officer plunging his knee knee on yeah. the back on, on, yeah. on, on no on the on the front like holding him down but it was he was knee oh, he, he, was, he, the, he had his knee the, on his chest right, and it, the, the pressure he applied when he first did it and mm. never let up mm. that's what i heard of that expression for the first time mm. i don't have no idea what case it was though mm -hmm. but that's mm -hmm. yeah. so so you know so they have the chest compression asphyxia then they had like we talk about in in baltimore they just talked about what they call the rough ride right yes right. but in other uh uh, places they call it the nickel ride, and right? The joy ride, right? Mm -hmm. So that means that these are widespread police right. practices right. Mm -hmm. that across different uh, uh, municipalities mm -hmm. and jurisdictions. They know these things. They even have names for them, and they do them, and they tell the same lies after they are caught. And right. This is what I saw in my research, and so what I'm thinking here, and what I would implore the people here in this area to do, since Hillary Clinton is the only presidential candidate in the last 12 years who said that she was going to de de defend and protect the human rights of all people, particularly women and children, that I think that, um, that, that, that the next time that officer-involved shootings come up, you need to quit calling them that and call them a summary execution. And y'all need, mm. need to look at how people are dying when the cop kills them and look at the other people that have died that way and, and quit talking about just everybody but talk about all the unarmed people that have died that particular way right, <laughs> you know right, because right, right. there's a lot of them and wow, you know, i'm not okay. even saying kitchen sink and everybody that's been killed by the cop i'm saying the unarmed people right because right. you ain't got no defense right, <laughs> for right, that right right, right. Yeah. <laughs> we're talking about, talking about categories i mean last june where we had six black females Killed in, 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 in police custody in the hands of the police. See, and we had, most people see. know about Sandra Bland, and mm. locally we know about Ray Turner, Turner, who was the last one. Yeah. But I, most people don't even remember the names of the other four. You know what I'm saying? But they, it, that was one month. Well, taking what I said before about the Black Lives Matter dynamic in, in human rights, okay, six black women, mm -hmm. six black women who had their human rights violated. Absolutely. Okay. They had their rights violated as black people. They had their human rights violated as women. Mm -hmm. Now, women who aren't black ought to be upset about that. You don't have to be black to be upset about police messing over unarmed women. So then I'm, I'm appealing to every woman that ain't black, if you're a woman and you protect women, you love women, whatever your relationship to women is, if you really love women, then look at these women, these unarmed black women, and lift up their call. Their blood is crying from the earth for somebody to speak up for them the way that people are speaking up for these young men. And I'm not saying that we should not continue to speak up for the young men, but ain't nobody speaking up for none of these these girls and right. these women and I'm saying that women need to step up I'm saying that as a macho man misogynist sexist pig you know that women need to step up and if you know talk about the black women that are on this list and create your own list because this is not an exhaustive list of, uh, of women that have been brutalized by police if white women stepped up and did that they'll not only find a lot of black women who have been unarmed that have been accosted by the cops they're going to find a lot of them have had that so then until until we are free nobody is and and and, and until we are free then they won't be free and that's why i say that 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 their humanity uh depends on protecting our black our blackness and our black humanity and if they can't protect our humanity as black people then their own humanity is going to be threatened as people yeah I, I just want to say that earlier this year Daniel was here and did a presentation at Westpac mm -hmm. and um, presented this research and then started to support a small group of people who are doing their own research of killings executions killings that are happening in Westchester that have happened in Westchester and putting them into human rights categories right and this document that you've created so I just, I just want to lift Nada Cotter from Westpac but also Tanya Thompson 
who was with the Ethical Society and with the Westchester Coalition for Police Reform for her leadership. And um, when we did a presentation the other night, she started to list people in Westchester who had been killed, unarmed people who had been killed by police and using the human rights language. And it was powerful to see this. I w I, 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 if, if possible, um, if they're listening, I, I would love to see that. Uh, the, yes, the, if they share that with Black Westchester, we will gladly post that. Uh, wonderful. I yes. mean, they're struggling for that because it isn't easy to get, get the, um, the data. But I just want to say that you've codified all of these into categories as a major document, like a framework and a template, Daniel. And we are very, very grateful for this because there was no way to envision you know, to see these categories, like the rough ride, and then to know in the past 25 years how many people unarmed have been killed by rough ride, uh, chest compression, you know, all the women. The, the research that you did, tell them about the research, how long it took you, and what it took out of your life mm -hmm. to do this research. Well, um, it, it, uh, it, it took last year. Uh, it took all last year. It took every, every day of last year, every, every waking hour of last year. Uh, and um, I'm uh, I'm challenged on the um, the use of a, a, a computer. So I <laughs> somebody asked me, well, you know, you can't find this stuff anywhere. How did you do it? And so I, I reached out in my pocket and I pulled out my cell phone. <laughs> wow! And I said I did I did the work off of my cell phone. Wow! And then when I would go into my office, then you know I could I could put words into the stuff that I had only put in in outline form on the cell phone. Right, but right. You, but of course, you got to be determined if you That's if you right. get into it like that. Absolutely. And uh, what what made me get determined? I'm I'm originally from Cincinnati, Ohio, and I used to uh, be a campus minister there and be a property owner there. A lot of my family is still there. Well, you remember there was a case last year of the brother who uh, was in his car. And um, the, the policeman come up to him and basically shot him in the neck. Mm. And um, the, the car uh, rolled away and then the cop chased after the car and then lied about it and said that, um, mm. that he had to fire into the car because right. the man was you know, trying to drag him and, and, police, and whatever. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. he was mm -hmm. a campus policeman from the University of Cincinnati out of his jurisdiction in the black community. I know because I used to work at the campus and I'm a property owner, I was a property right. owner in the community. So he was way out of his way to be checking on somebody, a brother for a license plate mm. down that uh, thing. He was out there because he was hunting niggers. I mean, let's look at what it, that's what he was down. And that's what I want to say about all of these cop killings is, is that they're not accident. These are, these are, this is racially motivated, state-sponsored terrorism. Mm. This is mm. what this is. They need to check each cop that kills a black say, person. Say that again. I'm sorry. Racially, Just... racially motivated, state-sponsored terrorism. terrorism. That's what it is. They need to check the background of every cop that's involved in killing a black person and see what is their profile with the Ku Klux Klan, the Nazis, or Donald Trump's family. Mm. 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 <laughs> Who, who, orig who, who originates from Germany? Red. Yeah. Who yeah. originates yeah. from yeah. Germany? That's right. yeah. whose, father, that's whose father came here because he's a draft dodger from Germany. So his father was too cowardly to fight in the war over in, in, uh, in Germany. He comes over here as a white man in the 1800s when we're under the Plessy versus Ferguson stuff. He can get a job. He can get land. He can get a business. He gets money. He gives birth to Donald Trump's father who gets arrested in a Ku Klux Klan rally in 1927, and then later on he can give his Donald Trump son a million dollars uh, based on what? Based on a white man from Germany coming over here and being able to take advantage of stuff that black people who built this country can't even take advantage of. That's right. For this joker to be running for president now and talking about building a wall, somebody should have built a wall when his old man and his <laughs> father was, uh, was, was coming over here and, and, and passing for white uh, because they didn't want people to know they were German. So that's why they changed their name from Trump to Trump. So, wow. then, uh, so then we got to call it the way it is. That's his, right. His idea about this wall is not his original idea. That, that idea was first propounded by the National States Rights Party in the 1980s, early 1980s. They're in Marietta, Georgia. They're the group that's in Newt Gingrich's congressional right, district. Right, I know and they're the exactly group where that is. is. That's, where Ma that's where Oprah Winfrey, you know, went down there, Forsyth County. Well, this is the place where... Uh, 
they um, they sell this hateful newspaper called the Thunderbolt newspaper, and they had to plan for what Donald Trump is talking about in that newspaper over 30 years ago. So that's not his idea. That's the Ku Klux Klan's idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I somehow I have to get you um, hooked up with Dr. Ron Daniels because um, the Pan African Unity Dialogue we have. Uh, meetings every quarter um, at um, 1199 uh, the Union 1199 in Manhattan and they are actually we ha they they are um, uh, United Nations I'm trying to think the word delegates delegates that actually come from Africa it, and from Africa Haiti, and Haiti from they, they actually come to the meetings and and what we're trying to do is build build a bridge to Africa with the different delegates, but also to hear what for them to hear what you're talking about, to take back to the different African countries that they represent about what's going on um, to people here, to, to, to people black people. people. Yeah. I, I think that that will also be very important because you know that's what the African Unity Dialogue is all about is is trying to get them get them this type of information and what's going on here. They should have this information because one of the categories that I have uh, that popped up was uh, was people of African descent from other countries mm -hmm. um, who uh, were unarmed and killed at the hands of police. We know oh, uh, about Amadou Diallo. Right. Uh, 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 um, then there's Luima. Right, uh, right. You know, and then there's a lot of others. But and we also know politics. They can have the information. Right. Right. But they ain't acted on the information. Well, well, See, we, we, we want to call the dialogue to make them yeah. act on no, the information. Uh, speaking about the information, and I meant to ask you this while you were talking earlier, is this, you, you have, is this like a report or something? Do you have this that can be shared? And like, I can share it on Black Westchester? Or is uh, that, yeah, or is I, can, I can't get to all of that right now. No, no, I mean, not today. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not, yeah, but yeah. I mean, if you... Yeah, I can. Share, yeah, we, can we can definitely share it. Be because... Crediting you, of course, but, yeah. you know, so that gets out there. Yeah, the um, yeah, there's a there's a group, a, um, a, a war press that protest group in the um, in the East Bay area that, that published the, um, the, the the female part of my list. Okay. And okay. The, the tip of the spear. Okay. And which is really, uh, like I say, it's a whole list of 140 people, but I'm more concerned about people seeing this list that I read to you partially. Right. Because well, ain't, ain't no arguing that. What was the group that we met at Broadway for Black Lives Matter? The professor with the husband that actually um, started the, the say say her name project, which which had oh uh, a list of black females that were killed in police custody. Mm -hmm. um, she she I, made a T-shirt. I don't remember her name. Um, and Bob, Bob Baskerville, Baskerville knows knew her, her so we could definitely because yeah. she was a professor before and she started the company with the, the, mm -hmm. the say my name because they um, mm -hmm. say her name uh, say her name um, when Ray Ned Turner and Mal Vernon um, yeah. happened. Cynthia, uh, one of our co-hosts, she carried that on, say her name, and they had a big thing for, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But this is the young lady who started that, was gathering the names of the females. That you yeah, and she actually printed a t-shirt with yeah, a, a lot that's of a good the tactic. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah I, have, I got a hoodie. I'm waiting yeah, for it to get cool. <laughs> like yeah, I yeah, she, yeah. To, to try to bring awareness to women that were killed in police, or killed by police, or killed in police custody. I wanted to revisit something that I mentioned no before, problem. Um, when we were talking about uh, racially motivated state-sponsored terrorism. The United States went to war in Afghanistan because Afghanistan was accused of harboring terrorists. And it spent a lot of money and a lot of lives because they said that they were harboring terrorists. Now, the, uh, the United uh, Nations and the world community has, has doesn't, does not yet have a treaty on terrorism, but they are working on it. And there's a part of it that has to do with state-sponsored terrorism, when a state sponsors terrorism against its own citizens. And part of what I'm doing is I'm creating a report that's going to be ready as soon as they get that, uh, that part of the treaty together, whether the United States has ratified it or not, I'm going to have a complaint that's going to fit their <laughs> definition of state-sponsored right. terrorism right. as Absolutely. it relates right. to the state-sponsored terrorism that, uh, that these black women and black men and black children have, have faced. Absolutely. Now, that being said, let me just say once again, we're victims and we're uh, objects in a race war. That's what we're in. We're not in a drug war. We're in a race war. We're in an asymmetrical war 
where most of the casualties are, are on one side. And, um, and in this race war, um, most, most of the people are doing it are dying. Now, a lot of your listeners who are veterans know that under the Geneva Convention, if you come upon an enemy that you have shot or you have wounded, then uh, under the Geneva Convention, you are obligated to help that enemy. The, uh, the police departments of the United States don't even give uh, us that right in the drug war, in the race war, because uh, you can be a, an unarmed woman laying on the floor dying, and they're waiting for you to bleed out before they call anybody. And so then, so then the denial of medical treatment is a um, is a is a torture. Mm. That's that's torture. Wow. Yeah, that's exactly what that is. And so um, what we need to do is call these things, like I say, what what they are. Uh, our people are being tortured. Our, our women are being mistreated through torture and summary execution, and men and children too. And we need to lift that up because there's a lot of war things. There's the torture prevent. Victims Protection Act uh, that has been used in domestic cases. There's actually reparations that you can claim as a result of being a victim under the Torture Victims Protection Act. Most of these black women that I read to you about, uh, you know, would, would qualify for that. So there's a lot of rights that we have uh, as human beings. So wait, if, like if their mother was tortured, the, the kids would be um, obligated to, I mean, could qualify for the reparations? Is well, that how it would go? Well, basically, if they had a, a, a lawyer who right. was looking at the, the the total field of things. Right, right, right. You know, like I'm, I'm here for the National Lawyers Guild Convention. Okay. Conviction, the convention, and I spoke at that the other day. And some of the lawyers were talking about how, you know, well, with, whatever law or statute fits your client in terms of helping them out, you you got to throw that out there. You know, because you don't know which of those things is going to be the thing that's going to tip the scale. Where where human rights are concerned, we had a we ought to always lift up our human rights, because every time we talk about our civil rights, we're only talking about our uh, our rights that are enshrined under the U.S. Constitution. But when you talk about our human rights, we're talking about not only God-given rights, but but rights that uh, that are under uh, a lot of other things. So if you were to put on a scale our our civil rights and our human rights, then the human rights would outweigh the, the civil rights, even though they are the same as many of our civil rights. Right, right, right. I just want to let everybody know who's watching the show. Um, gentleman that just stepped in is Reverend Edward Mulrane. He's running for 36th District um, Senate in 36th District. Um, we're going to get to him a little later, but I, I wanted y'all to know who the next person in the room was, so. Uh, welcome him to the show. Um, shout to uh, Brother Arthur who's on the check-in and everyone else. I'm not going to be able to get to everybody's name, but shout to everybody listening, Denise Cardoza, Branch, and all of y'all. Um, a lot of people are into what you're saying. A lot of people are really... Oh, re oh, re oh yeah, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, you, you got people hey, clicking like and, and well, stuff. And like, yeah, well, so, well, well, I'm, well, I'm humbled by that. I'm glad that people are taking the time to listen. So now, now what made you... I don't know if you broke down what's your back. What made you get into what brought a lot of times when sometimes we get into stuff like that, it, it's like Kenneth Chamberlain. It happened to his father. So then he became an advocate. You know what I'm saying? Or um, was this something that you was always on your mind or how did you well, all of this come to be? Well, well, like I say, I'm I'm uh, I'm from Cincinnati. I now live in Oakland. I'm seeing this stuff on the news about the brother, you know, where I live he gets shot I know that that's a lie he shouldn't even been over there and uh, it just I was just pissed off I mean, I'm, okay you know, okay ministers get pissed off too don't we <laughs> that's right so yeah. I was pissed off so uh, I um, it, around that time uh, Sandy who I guess had a common feeling with me uh, she we were talking on the phone and she was saying well what can be done and I said well these are clearly human rights violations she said they are and then she reminded me of that 10 years ago I had uh, represented uh, the victims of Hurricane Katrina before the UN and asked me if I thought that that was possible for this and I said well maybe for somebody else I'm on the bench right now and uh, but you know when this brother got shot I had to get up off the bench you, you know and because um, I'd been watching these patterns over the years you, you know when whenever they when they say well the brother he died like this and 
you know, we just handle him and he just broke. <laughs> like that Richard Pryor joke. Yeah, that's right. just, can, can you break him? Oh, can you break him? Can you break him? Yes, you can break him. Yes, you can break him. Right. Yes, you can break him. Yes, you can break him. Right. It's okay. Okay. Good job, guys. Good job, guys. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, you know, so you know, you see enough of that. <laughs> I said, well, wait a minute. I, this is sounding like the same lie that, right, I, that right, I heard right. on, on on this particular. And thing. for people who don't know, Oakland. That's that was. Um, the birth of the, you know, the Panthers, where the Panthers movement right. came from, and a lot of other yeah. movements came from, a lot of yeah, the, activity. That's, that's right, yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 and still, you know, see, and that's, that's the other thing, and I, I want to say that in terms of, of roots. See, the Black Lives Matters movement comes from Oakland. Yes. And, uh, but they don't understand what their real roots are because they're too influenced by the white people from the Occupy movement, and uh, mm. that's dangerous because as long as they're influenced by these young white people from the Occupy movement, they're gonna sever themselves from the real movement that gave birth to them in the first place and gave them the, fe the freedom and the pride and the knowledge that they could say that Black Lives Matter. So you don't jump up in Oakland as black as it is, <laughs> you know, as Black Pantherish as it is, and you're gonna say, well, our movement is different than every other movement and better than every other is because we, we're a leaderless movement like the white folk over here. You know, mm -hmm. don't don't rub that in our face. Right, right, you, right. You, you, you know, so that's why I say I, I have an attitude about young young people popping up like a mushroom with no roots. The difference between a mushroom and a tree is the mushroom uh, don't have roots. It grows up overnight and it grows in the darkness. Trees take time and they need light. Mm -hmm. and, this, and, and that's what we need in the movement. And deep roots. And deep, deep roots. roots to, to sustain right. and, and, and deep roots. Yeah. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I do want to say something because you're not, you're not really giving a good introduction or explanation of who you are, so I'm going to have to do that. Okay. okay? You, you, pull yeah. a mic, and pull the mic a little so, closer to you. Yeah, yeah, After yeah. 40 minutes later, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, really, Daniel Buford has been, um, you know, one of the founding members of the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond and the Undoing Racism Workshop for over 40 years has been developing um, you know, the, the, that whole experience. And um, for anybody who's done the workshop, um, if you were lucky enough to get that unit on militarism and, li and linguistic racism, that's uh, Daniel Buford's contribution to that. Mm. And so he's been organizing all around this country for over 40 years, right, with the People's Institute. And right now he's the executive director of the Micklejohn Civil Liberties Institute in Oakland. And um, they're a human rights entity, and they were the people that really, so you could t talk about that, but had him uh, go to the UN with the, with the human rights violations of Katrina and then to the World Court. And when he was there at the World Court, uh, it was all of this report of the violations, it was as a result of that that the United States had a speck of shame, possibly, and millions of dollars was released to the victims of, of Katrina. And so that's why when all of these killings were happening or all of these executions were happening and we, we talked, I said, David, uh, Daniel, do you think that what you did for Katrina, you could do for uh, the killings? And that's how we get him here. But in addition to that, he is an artist and does the most phenomenal sculptures. I heard. Out of wood. Unbelievable. I heard. I heard. Yeah. 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 So anyway, that's Daniel Buford. And, and, the, and the reason he was from Oakland, and I, br I brought the Panthers up, and we'll talk about this another day, uh, Brother Damon um, alerted me that the, uh, the full movie of uh, uh, Spook at the Door was on, the, uh, was on, the, was on, on YouTube. YouTube, and I watched that last night, oh, and, yeah. I watched, <laughs> and I watched the, um, the long interview with him before, then and now. Um, oh, I and, didn't see that. One. I, I sent you the link, and I'm like, we we gonna have a whole another show about that because that's we man, need to discuss listen, man, that. I love that. But movie, but man. one of the things that they were saying is that was one of the required viewing for the Panthers. Yeah. That, 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 movie, yeah. that movie and um, the one Melvin Van Peebles did. Um, a sweet yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Those, yeah. those were two. Yo, those are two. Those were two. Um, yeah. They were. Um, yeah. The required viewing, or uh, yeah, let, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm glad to hear that. You know, the church where where I am, Allen Temple Baptist Church, our storefront used to be the Black Panthers headquarters. Oh, uh, really? Huey, Huey P. Newton, okay, and Bobby Seal have members who are members of of our church. Huey P. Newton was funeralized and memorialized, and was a member of our church. Okay, wow. and, and wow. was buried History. from and, and was buried from our our church. Okay, okay, and so then. Um, we uh, we are part of that legacy still, and if you go to our our church, you'll see a mural that has Black Panther iconography on there, and it's etched in stone okay. as to our relationship to the Black Panthers. 
So oh, wow. then, so then, I not, t- not your average black church thing. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, no, no. Well, with, I, the, I would, with the white Jesus, with the white Jesus sitting no, in the no, middle. No, no, no. In, 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 in our in our church, in our church, Jesus Jesus is black at Allen Temple, and then, and Philip baptized in the Ethiop- Ethiopian eunuch is in the baptistry, uh, and and Jesus and his disciples are a bunch of brothers kicking it, wearing robes and calf I got know, I got a Bible done, like that. Done, done in the, you got a in couple the of my dreads too. Yeah, like, yeah, this is art done in the Ethiopian Coptic right. style. Wow. Coptic, yes, the, the architecture of the uh, building, even though it was designed by a Japanese man, he designed it to look like, like an African hut. And, and, wow, really? Yeah. Wow. So that's Allen Temple. Uh, Dr. J. Alfred Smith Sr. Uh, really, really yeah, I, was I have to. That that's one of my. It's going to be one of my trips. Is now the, the leader. Yeah. It's going to be one of my. Uh, I'm going to put that on my bucket list. Yeah, yeah. Now that I, I know that. got to come out there. Next time I go yeah, to California, yeah. I got to make that trip. Yeah, please do. Yeah. I got some friends in the Bay Area, so I. Yeah. I think my wife's uh, aunt is in Oakland. So yeah, we'll, it'll we'll be we'll another reason. Stop, stop we were just through. talking about going out to visit, and now it's another reason yeah. to definitely go out and visit. Well, that's a historical spot uh congresswoman barbara lee is a member of that congregation wow, who's okay. the only person of course who voted or one of the few people that voted against that war uh, in in iraq so i, I just want to say that it's an honor to be at that church i serve right now as the prophetic justice minister which wow. uh means that i'm i'm like the the church's barking dog you know okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know you need a dog to, to to warn the people who are coming in for a threat but you need to warn the people inside the house what's coming right right right, so right, then, right so then as a barking dog i'm also a policy analyst for the lord so i look at policies whether it's a police policy transportation policy execution policy and i can predict the future as a prophet of god mm. and then i organize people around these things and i stop stuff from happening before it happens uh, because uh, I organized to t- I teach David how to fight Goliath. I train, That's right. I train David to fight Goliath with five smooth stones mm. on, on every issue. And, I, you know, you can Google me on the things I've been involved in in Oakland. And I, uh, and, and I don't go into an issue to lose. I go in to win, and, That's I, do, right. and I do win. And that's why I feel that, that we can win as a people if we begin to focus our energies on the black women and children that are being killed on here because it's going to take the moral high ground. You right, know, right. As that's going to establish the moral high ground on all of this Black Lives Matter stuff because you can't argue about a cop's state of mind of being in fear if the woman is 92 and the child is 7 laying under a blanket. So, right, right, right. So I think that we can win with that, and I'm right. excited. I believe that. it, too. <laughs> well, actually, um, and two things. So are, are y'all in a rush, or can y'all stay? Stay. Okay. I want to um, give uh, Reverend Moraine the chance to speak and sure. since he's in the house, and um, I know he's running for office and stuff, but I, I definitely want to, you know, give y'all a chance to come back to that, though. Okay. Um, pull your mic up. Introduce sure. yourself. Reverend Edward Moraine, Pastor Uni Baptist Tabernacle in Mount Vernon, New York. Very familiar with Aaron on Temple. Um, that uh, J. Alfred Smith was there. His son is running it now, yes, right? Yes, yeah, yes. yeah, we're familiar with that. And fighting for justice all my life as president of the NAACP uh, for 12 years in the Williamsburg section of the Bronx. So I had a lot in terms of encounters with police misconduct and fighting against police uh, injustice in the Bronx as well as in Mount Vernon. Make sure so, you speak to the mic too. Oh, so, I'm sorry. Yeah. And so I'm move, here to just talk about. It goes down. It, it goes down. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like to look at people yeah, when I'm yeah, talking, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll focus on you. <laughs> so definitely, we've been uh, around for a little while, and now we're taking that natural progression into the New York State Senate seat, 36th district, which includes the Bronx and Mount Vernon, and areas we've been fighting for for a long time. So really, the only candidate in the race that has that. Um, that that connection with both the Bronx and Mount Vernon, and we're seeking to go to Albany to fight the fight that we've always been fighting. So I uh, thank you for this opportunity, AJ and, Damon. And God bless you. And Anytime, I know, brother. Yeah. Anytime. And I know the one of the reasons you wanted to um, come today is because you have something going on tomorrow. Yeah, right? we have a big rally going on tomorrow. It includes uh, it's at Grace Baptist Church in Mount Vernon. Uh, it includes Reverend Dr. Calvin Butts. It includes Reverend Al Sharpton, uh, Reverend Dr. W. Franklin Richardson, uh, Reverend Renee Washington. A host of pastors and elected officials will be there 
community leaders. Our candidacy is one of grassroots of the community. So we're 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 looking to put two, three hundred people on the streets and tomorrow will be a big rally at Grace Baptist Church beginning at seven PM. It will be leaders from not only ministers, we have a lot of religious leaders absolutely, but we have a lot of community leaders that are also supporting us from the Bronx, Manhattan, everywhere in order to uh, claim this district. So the big event is tomorrow, seven PM and we would hope that all of you would be there. As, as always, shout to Brenda L. Crump. So as soon as she heard your voice, she has put your campaign literature poster up here. And people her. can click on it. And while we were talking, she posted, Reverend Daniel A. Buford heads the Prophetic Justice Ministry at Allen Temple. That's he's a founding, he's a founding <laughs> organizer and trainer of the People's <laughs> Institute for Survival and Beyond, <laughs> based in New Orleans, uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, and has conducted undoing racism workshops throughout the United States, South Africa, Japan, Puerto Rico since 1980. And then she put a link to your profile for people to go read the rest of it. Right. Yeah, so I, we, we have a young lady who, no matter what you talk about, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but it's no matter what you talk about, like if you just started talking about something and it was a case and there was something, something that happened in, you know, 2009 or something, while we're talking, it was something, boop, and it just pop up on the screen. <laughs> well, I'm glad she's listening. I'm glad she's doing that because... Yeah. Uh, these, like, uh, and, and down that say your name tip, these names need to be said over and over again. Since, mm -hmm. uh, since it's Sunday and I was able to preach a little bit today, I'm going to just, just do a little preaching right now for a moment. When, uh, Make when, sure you get your mic a little when, closer to When Yeah, on this part particularly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. when, uh, when, when, when God encountered Cain after he had killed his brother Abel, he asked him, where's your brother? Right. And um, brother said, "I don't know. I, I ain't, I ain't my kid. I'm, I ain't my turn to watch him. Right, you right. God, you ought to tell me. I ain't my brother's keeper." Right. And then God is like, "Well, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries to me from the earth, mm. and this is what we must do to lift up these names. Their blood cries from the earth." Yeah. You know, we're the people here who are still, we, we don't have post-traumatic stress. We have persistent traumatic stress. Wow. We're the victims and the experiencers of the Ma'afa ma right this moment. A lot of our ancestors came over here and, and died in the Middle Passage and never did have a funeral. And each wave of the, Pacific, uh, of the Atlantic Ocean is like a grave marker for our people that never had a funeral that is with an unmarked grave. And these people, if, if they die at the hands of these police and we don't repeat their names and their cases and the vitality of their names and say their names and say their cases and learn about them, then, um, then, then, then we're not worthy of sharing their heritage. Uh, wow. Then, uh, then, then in order to be worthy of their name and, sh and share their heritage and pass it on, we must say their names and we must do our own independent research. Uh, there's people who are listening to you who are a lot smoother than me with a computer and can do a lot more with a cell phone than I did. And uh, if you can do it, do what you can do. Uh, uh, but if I can do what little I can do, then you can do a whole lot more. This is why, as a minister, I don't go around calling myself doctor because you've got too many fools and do who, <laughs> who are stupid as hell calling themselves doctor, as doctor, and they ain't healing nothing. <coughs> And they're not healing the community, <laughs> and uh, and you know, and I'd be ashamed to tell anybody where well, I went no, to I school. I just got applause. I just got Yeah, where I went to school. Yeah, I'm sorry. All right, yo, that so that I, just goes with applause right there. So I don't call my. So the. So today somebody read my bi my my bio and and then started referring me to me as doctor, and I thanked them for the doctorate, but I don't need that, yet, you know. And so uh, I think that, that that the ministers need to step up, and step out from behind hiding from these these fake doctorates and stuff right. and start acting like they really know something right. and if you if you really doctor something and start healing the community Ooh. and start uh, start healing the relationships between the cops and the community start healing the relationship start raising if you really a doctor raise the question around why is a cop attacking unarmed women of any color start mm. right there and you'll start some healing of yourself and your own soul and, 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 and I'm Their about to go to you. Is crying from the earth. Right. That's I, and right. I'm about to go right to you. But uh, I just wanted to say, my my pastor from Georgia, and I always use this quote. He says, "Any church that does not positively impact the community that it resides in is a waste of real estate." Amen. Right. 
Amen. Yeah. Amen. So, well, let me say this. I think I think that it's unfortunate, but churches have not been involved, and to some extent, some churches because they don't have that particular calling on their lives probably would be best to stay out of things because mm-hmm. they may mess things up, mm-hmm. especially <laughs> when it comes to civil justice. <laughs> but if you have been called, mm-hmm. and the different people you look throughout the Bible, different pastors were called for different, different prophets were called for different things in order to heal the community. Hezekiah called to heal within. David called to heal the nations and bring them together. Mm -hmm. So you want to have that calling responsibility. But I think whatever you do, I do God's wants us to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before your God. And I think that if we know our responsibility is to make sure that we go out there, there's something maybe maybe your thing may not be going up against police officers. But you can feed somebody. You can open up the doors and close somebody. You can become a shelter. Your church. Some of us have great big churches, and it's sitting there until Sunday with no activity going on in it. You can do something. There there are programs out there where we could house the homeless. We can do something. Um, so I, Stop I, charging I so much that, for child care I'm sorry Yeah, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah child care, everything I mean, it, there's so much that you could do Within the confines of a building In order to show that you're trying to help the community Because it's really The service takes uh, place with, uh, outside the community Talk about outside, the, uh, outside, outside the walls outside, of the I'm church. sorry, outside the wall of the church right. And I preached on that today Talking about, you know If we really were to do the work that God sent us to do, we would have much more peace and justice in the world that we live in. But I think some of us, we just ignore God's calling upon our lives, whatever that may be, in order to do for the for the work of people. And, and, and I, you know, it's funny because my pastor always said, you know, people always tell you, go out and help somebody you don't know. He right. said, you know what? He said, if everybody helped those around them, there would never be nobody you don't know. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Because everybody would be helped. You you know what I'm saying? Right. (laughs) But may I say something that may be um, political and may not be appreciated? Uh, Just to show for it. You know, I go to a church and they're constantly giving and doing and doing and doing, you know, helping the poor, 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 poor. But they don't stop and ask, well, why are people poor? Mm -hmm. And what's our responsibility? to address the structural and political arrangements that keep driving the poverty. And so I'm always afraid when I, um, I'm not afraid, I'm just uh, reactive when I hear of churches that are into the service, like social work. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I mean? Social work does the same thing. We deliver services. But the question is, like, what are we going to do about the drive for the services to understand why people are poor and why the systems are driving pain and suffering so that we can have work? So I want to just put that out for but, the But that's a good too. point. I, I think that's an excellent point. But I think that too many times we're so focused on just doing for poor and it remains poor. That's right. So you, you give social services, you give food, but um, there's no transformation of conditions because you're not effectuating the system. That's right. And if you're not effectuating the system, all we're going to do is come out every day and say, let's feed the poor. Let's give shelter to this person. When do, when do, we, when do we teach when, them how to when fish? Do we when do we challenge it? So right. they can feed exactly. Themselves. Let's no. challenge yeah. the system to transform it so that people can begin to own homes, own their property, own their community. That's, the, that's what Jesus was all about. He was all about transformation. Yeah, but what do we do about fair housing and and housing discrimination? In the mic, in the mic. Yeah, you make sure. We, we need uh-huh. to deal with fair housing issues and housing discrimination because you can say, you know, get that job, mm-hmm. but because of job discrimination, the job's not there. You can say, get that house, but because of housing it's discrimination, just, uh, right. right? So we have to have that analysis that says you are not always responsible for your problems. Mm. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you're in the condition that, like Malcolm X said, you live in a poor neighborhood, you get a poor education. Poor Good education job. prepares job. you for a poor job. Poor paying job allows you right. to live once again in That's a poor right. neighborhood. Right. So it's systemic and it's interconnected. Right. Right. And but you know, I mean, I mean, if we're if we're about transformation, That's right. you know, why can't why have, we don't have the power to transform our own communities? You know, I mean, we don't have to. I, I you know, this whole thing with. This whole discrimination thing with HUD and worry about putting houses in white communities that don't want no poor people, no matter what color they're in. But we, you know, we fail to say, well, let's take our own communities, the communities that we're in, and make them livable and viable communities. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you know, if we're going to transform, right. you know, let's transform our own communities. Right. You know, yeah. we have failed to even transform our own communities into. In, in, in into communities that that everybody would want to but live in. But this is the thing, Damon. The thing is, when we start talking about transforming our own communities, 
it's not us who's transforming it. Then we get into gentrification. You look at Harlem right now and how Harlem used to be and how it is now. It's a total transformation. But what happened to us? We're no right. longer in the community. We East New York. Out. It's right, right. Out the transform means no, and, when, and when you're it right. starts getting better, then all of a sudden we have to get out. The, the, the no, rents raised. Right. The, the the community is better. And See, I can't speak no on Harlem, but I can speak and on Mount Vernon. I, I can yeah, speak on Westchester. Mount Vernon. I can right. speak on Westchester. But East we're the New ones. York. But we're the ones that made the deal to make our communities poor. You know, it was the Democrats that made the deal to allow uh, 23% of all people that's living on social services being a four by four square mile of city. Mm. I mean, they knew that since 1992 when Andrew O'Rourke, the African American Advisory Board, put out the report and said this was going to happen. Right. But nobody did anything. Right. So, so I mean, you know, we could talk, we understand gentrification, right. but we also understand that there was political deals that allowed right. Port Chester. Um, Osning, Peekskill, right. Mount Vernon, and right. certain part of Yonkers, Yonkers to remain poor. So how? So now, how are we going to push back on the grand deal that we made in 1992? See, because because of the fact that now, when more people are seeing the potential of Mount Vernon, mm -hmm. you know, but the political process and the but then, and the political deal makers right. are not going to allow it to happen. Because where are you going to put the poor people? Mm. See, because Astorino, he he don't care. He don't care about. And he shouldn't because that's not his problem. He, he, he don't care about putting the homes in, in the white neighborhoods. And the white neighborhoods don't even want it. Not even Hillary Clinton's neighborhood that's only 3% black. You understand? Right. And, they're, and, and they're fighting the houses that, 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 that go in there because they, <laughs> they don't want it there. You know? And it's an outside entity that brought that lawsuit. You know, and we're still losing because now the federal government is saying because Westchester County is not abiding by the housing. Now the federal government is pulling back grants and they're pulling back everything. And, and where are those grants supposed to go to, to our communities? Right. You know, so we're losing on we're losing on both ends. But nobody's stepping up and saying, you know, how do we make these neighborhoods, you know, better livable and, and start and start worried about. You know, and, and stop worried about putting housing in people's neighborhoods that don't want us there. How do we how do, how do we get that money and make our neighborhoods better? I mean, Ma Mayor Davis, one of the things he always said was that they were there was a lot of money that was owed to us because of those situations that you right, said right. that right. we were not getting, and they was giving us less and less of it. Right. And um, you know, we voted for change and all that and everything, but instead of some of the things we're dealing with, that's what we should be. That's what I want to see from our elected officials is going after that money that's due to Mount Vernon. So Mount Vernon, you can stop taxing everybody to death. <laughs> and, I mean, Mount Vernon is the highest taxes and the worst place to live right now. You know what I mean? It's in, in Westchester, one of the top five richest counties in Westchester and, and the United States of America. You know what I'm saying? We, we, you right. know, we, we pay more taxes than anybody else. Mm -hmm. Well, you know I mean, that's saying? because because that that's because we. I mean, that's and, because and there's things, so many things going on now. It, there's going to be a major tax right. double because that's because there's so many concentration right. con, um, concentrated people that need not not only that you have a, you have a high percentage of of, of, of senior citizens right. that are on fixed income. Now you're you know then you're putting on people that 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 are, are 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 poor and they're purposely doing it it's not like that it's, it's it's not like they're saying okay well we can't find housing over here no they're sending them straight to mount vernon you know and and that is a problem and nobody's and and not one elected official is pushing back on, on pushing back on that and saying you know we we have we have our share can we actually get the dollars to take care of them you know, you know, I mean, you know, the circle is like um, the Statue of Liberty. Give us your poor, your needy and, and everything and, 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 and come in, and come into Mount Vernon. I mean, and that has to be addressed. I know they wanted to say something. Yeah. What, what you're describing here. Um, and I'm going to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to describe it from another viewpoint, you know, uh, as being an outsider that sees it happen in other places. All right. What you're describing here is, is what's going on all over the country but has been perfected actually in France, yeah. Paris, France. If you, uh, you might remember a few years ago when there were a lot of riots in Paris mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they said yes, that right. the, uh, the, the, the mm -hmm. black community, the Africans basically in the Middle Eastern were the ones that, that were upset and you know, and they were burned up. They're basically doing in their communities what we were doing mm -hmm. based on police misconduct and mm -hmm. you know, when they were, they were responding. Well, um, the interesting thing about those uh, those conflicts was is that they weren't inner city riots. 
they weren't inner city uprising and rebellion because Paris doesn't have their poor people in the city. They have them on the outskirts of the city. Mm. Right, right. And so um, what you see in all over the, the country, particularly since the 1970s and the, uh, and the oil crisis and the return of, uh, of, of the urban pioneer, you, you see that uh, we are being put out of the cities. Like in South Africa, they had the, the, the crawls and the Bantu stands on the outskirts of the city. Uh, and you know, and then on the in, in skirts of the city, you have your your richer and your middle class. So, what we're seeing is is the reshifting and refocusing of where the populations are concentrated. This is important because a lot of things happen when your co- population gets concentrated. Poverty can get concentrated, but in a military and a political sense, in a uh, a police uh, occupation sense, your community can be easily cut off and laid siege to if everybody's on the outskirts of the city and they all have to uh, travel large distances to get where there's a, lot of, a large number of you, if you know what I mean. So then these are things that are being thought out, not just on the city planning level of, of, uh, of economics, but our communities, are, our communities are placed and surrounded with military considerations uh, in mind. That's why by the freeway exits you have your, your National Guard and your Highway Patrol so close and in every black community, uh, the, the city has a belt freeway with three uh, letters, and you have freeways that run north and south that, that have odd numbers, and freeways that run east and west with uh, with even numbers, and that looks like a big target. And and that's what every black community is. It has a circle freeway, and then it has no Atlanta. Yeah, Atlanta has a circle around right. Atlanta, right. And, and then every and everything else is five ten minutes o- outside right. of yeah. you, outside you, you, of you Atlanta. See, you see what I'm, yeah. I'm, right, I'm that, describing? That, you, you, that's, that's that's military. Yeah, that, that, that's a military. And we were talking thing. about how um, what was brought to me by some conscious brothers out there were telling me, basically, I don't know if it's in place yet, but there's a, a system in place that right now they can shut down like you just said any major city mm-hmm. you know what i'm saying uh, with the by, national guard and all by, the, by, by grid right matter, by, matter yeah. of fact when we had huey p newton's funeral uh, uh and everybody was there the world media was there but the the only place where electricity went off was the block where our church is where our church owns a whole block <laughs> <laughs> and, and for some reason, the only place just that grid, and, and we and we be paying our bills. <laughs> but, but for some reason, while they're talking about this brother and trying to give him a send off, uh, the power structure shut off the electricity. And I'm just saying that they, our communities are such that uh, we got to be wise in the way that we we rise up because they've already been wise in the way that they have put us. Right, 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 right. No, I t- I totally agree. Um. We, comments or thoughts so uh, I, you know my former background is an urban planner and as we talk about these communities and us transforming and I look at I, I always look at other cities or neighborhoods to compare to Mount Vernon and where we are now in Mount Vernon and the need for affordable housing to be developed in the community and being secretary of Ujamaa Development Corporation where we built almost uh, almost more than a hundred units so far and there's another unit coming up on on uh, Fifth Avenue that we, uh, Ujamaa Community Development has built under the uh, passive Reverend Dr. W. Franklin Richardson and Ujamaa Development Corporation. We've been working on housing, affordable housing for our people in the community as well as senior housing. Well, let me, let and, me start, let me, uh, you know what? I, and I see and, this everywhere, not just Mount Vernon. Right. The term affordable housing right. is being thrown around and most people I know can't afford to live there. That's the, that's the, I, I'm just saying, no, I'm just that, saying. That's like, the thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 and, affordable and when you, who? when you talk about yeah, affordable, yeah, yeah. you have to define that. Because there's so much, like in the city, when they talk about affordable housing, it's it's a certain income, certain amount of people in the family, and you can't be making a and certain amount. 19, when we had and, when we had Conscious Brothers in Harlem, they yeah. built a new building on 116th Street. The family income was a hundred and something. That there was nobody in that area legally making a hundred thousand dollars. Anyway, legal nobody legally was making. Not that lived in the projects in that area right. was making a, over a hundred thousand right. dollars. So that automatically meant they didn't want nobody there living there. Right. You, you understand? What I'm saying? And you see what <laughs> and you see what they got now. Right. And, and you know, it's like 
It's like a chocolate chip cookie sometimes. Right. Like, oh, there's a black person. There's a black right. person. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. There's another one right there. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? But, so but like, we have to look at it in terms of affordable, in terms of even for working class families. Like coming out of college, you're a professional, you want to live in Mount Vernon, you should be able to do that. You shouldn't have to choose between the high taxes of one end and then the core poverty of another end. Why can't you have affordable ads in working class professionals that want to have start families that can't afford the high taxes in the homes, but at the same time up and coming with their families in the city uh, where they could get close to transportation, go to the city if they have to work or work in the Mount Vernon, White, White Plains, wherever they have to work and come back to Mount Vernon and feel comfortable within the city that they grew up in and lived in. But oftentimes we're talking about an extreme that exists, especially in Mount Vernon. We're talking about the extreme of hundred. And thousands of hundreds of thousands of homes and then poverty on the other end. Where's the in-between in that? And that's what we have to concentrate more and more when we talk about building affordable housing for working class families. Okay. Yo, um, we're all coming close to the end of the show. Um, I know you mentioned what you have going tomorrow. Yes. Um, briefly, first of all, my other pastor always said, Never give a mic to a pastor. <laughs> you wouldn't say brief, you know, what, is, what does so, that mean? So brief, <laughs> so 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 briefly. Um, uh, I mean, you're here, you're running right. your platform or something. But yeah, briefly. Yeah. Well, as I stated before, urban planning development. Um, I think that's very important as a primary in terms of my platform because it has to do with not only making the city look better. We need the rehabilitation, building of our bridges. We need the rehabilitation of buildings in our community. But it also has to do with jobs. When you talk about infrastructure, you're talking about jobs. Our people need jobs. Unemployment is low. We need to make sure that through road development, through building development through bridges development that we get some of those contracts in our community and that we get some of those jobs for our people who live in the community we've been instrumental in that whenever we develop housing to make sure that 50 percent of those contracts go to black minority businesses secondly we need to make sure that safety is in our community as you know at times mount vernon just like every other city faced a high percentage of us versus us in those communities the crime we're not only talking about police misconduct but we're talking about um black people um, uh, are responsible for other black people's death and we need to make sure that there's safety measures in place programs that are uh, helping our young people to um, have conflict resolution and conflict management within our after school programs and snug programs in order to help them fight against the damages of violence within ourselves in our community so that becomes for important on our platform and there are a host of other things and uh, education uh, criminal justice reform as president of the NAACP I'll just tell you this one thing one thing I fought for was uh, what you would call prison based gerrymandering what they were doing was sending monies to the uh, place where inmates from the city were housed Mm -hmm. I sued the state two, three years ago. We sued the state. Me, Justice, uh, Justice Brennan Department sued the state in order to say that the money that's going upstate where inmates are housed, but they actually reside in the Bronx and in Brooklyn, that that money shouldn't go upstate. That money should come back down to the areas where they live. We were successful in that lawsuit. Now the census money and all that money that was going upstate is now coming back downstate to the actual residents of where those individuals live. We've been on the forefront of criminal justice reform, and that's something I hope to continue uh, because I believe that we're doing an injustice by this recidivism. When you don't give inmates an opportunity when they come home to be citizens and have a skill, all you're doing is uh, creating an environment where they um, look for victims and go right back inside the system. And the recidivism rate is high, especially in our community. So we have a large platform. We hope that we will see you tomorrow, 7 p.m., Grace Baptist Church in Mount Vernon, New York. Thank you, AJ. Thank you, Damon, for this opportunity. All right, all right. No doubt, no doubt, no doubt. Um, you know, and we, we're going to bring some of the other candidates and further along, you know, we're going to give you, Absolutely. you know, your own time to actually, you know, really have a, uh, you know, a, a conversation and uh, right. a few of your other candidates have already requested, you know, appearing as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then I hope you plan on advertising because you're advertising. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Your candidate, your fellow candidates yeah, are talking yeah, about yeah, advertising. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, about, I'm, I'm <laughs> taking, I'm not calling nobody's name. I'm I just whoever paid. That's who I will be you. on, you know, so, but yeah, that's, that's, that's what's up. But, um, I just wanted to, um, give you a chance to, to run that down. I was getting ready to say something and then you, you were talking and I forgot. Um, 
I was about to address something that you. Oh, the job thing. The, mm-hmm. I think that's the biggest thing, and everybody dances around this. Right. Okay, so again, we talk about affordable housing. Can't nobody afford it because ain't nobody got no jobs. Mm. Or if they do have jobs, whether it's here or Atlanta or wherever, um, in Atlanta, I lived in Atlanta, and I've used this example. Two of the biggest employees are McDonald's Mm -hmm. and Walmart. Mm -hmm. And over 80% of the employees are on some sort of uh, um, uh, Section 8. Most of them are on food stamps. Most of them are, you know, getting something. Because they're not paid a decent wage. So it's not even like that's the thing. We talk about jobs, and sometimes in these situations, and cities like Mount Vernon will give you some jobs. Mm-hmm. But if you're giving us jobs that can't pay our bills right. or we can't afford affordable housing, they're not doing us any good. Right. You know uh, what there, I'm saying? There was a word for that back in the day, it was called sharecropping. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> where after slavery, people, people uh, were they weren't slave and they weren't free. Right. Uh, they couldn't move too far from the plantation that had just released them, so they began to do sharecropping, and end up having to buy their tools from Massa now. They had, and buy even the the plants. He that said, they, "I can't the, pay you, the, but well, don't the, worry the about very, paying me. What, what am I going to do with some money?" And the crops that they were producing, they had yeah. to pay their and buy from the company store. So this is this is the relationship right. that the economy has created for us that has now just been revived in what you're talking about. It's, it's sharecropping. <laughs> you know, Damon, you, you often say that Mount Vernon has uh, 23% of um, all of, public of subsidies or welfare. Of welfare. Right? And, Mount Vernon. and so if we're going to lift those families struggling to make ends meet, we have to do something about penalizing people for working. We have to find a way to encourage people to find work once those jobs are created without losing those those safety net benefits yeah. that are so essential. Because somebody, we, we know that they will not be paid enough. So when you threaten to remove their food stamps or their uh, a few hundred dollars a month, yeah. You know, so you're gonna have to do something about that. Right. Well, they got they got they got to hide they got to hide the, the, they got to hide the computer low. in the in the in the closet like Claudine. Yeah. You know, because the people is coming. You know, right. like, like yeah, the yeah, and that's unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> we, but the, you help. you increase the the threshold because they have it so low, and then when you start yes. making more, it's like they would want you to stay in poverty the that's way right. it's set up. Exactly. It's same thing when we're trying to send our young people to college. You have to be so poor in order to go to college, in order to receive some benefits. But there are struggling middle class families out there as well. If you increase that and say, we'll give you more subsidies right. in order to get to college, it would help us out a lot. But keep that safety uh, net but there. But keep the safety net, right, until they get to a certain threshold where they can feel free and to there, get on. Nobody people, wants to stay on and it. And there are people who will never <laughs> get to that threshold. They will be bottom stuck, working full time, two jobs, at minimum wage. But weight. that's the system you're talking. Exactly. They, they, no, you don't. We want to change the structure of the system where they can get people off. Okay. Fifteen dollars increase was good, but that that was nowhere good enough. If you look at the poverty rate and you look at what it takes yeah, to get a family, yeah, but it's not fifteen everywhere. It didn't go up. Well, we're talking about, and it's not even fifteen yet. Yeah, but even right. If it's fifteen. If that's if what mother, we're going up to. But we're talking. It should be. It should be way more than that. If we want to release people Isn't 15, from the... Isn't 15 dollars an hour still exactly. under the exactly. poverty level? Exactly. Very much so. Okay, I just very you know. much so. So I beg you to continue right. those subsidies until well, a family can really get on their feet, and for those who can't, because mm-hmm. they're stuck at fifteen dollars an hour with one parent and four children, right. they need sustained. And and the thing about it, if you if you if you um, tell them we're gonna keep these subsidies until the family get on their feet, it'll probably push them a little harder to make the wage increase the wages so that they can get on the right track and get off of these subsidies or else we'll just continue the subsidies until they're able right. to free themselves but $15 from the dollars an hour times 40 hours a week is $600 a week right that's what that's are you going to do with that enough. what are you going to do with a, that a and that's not even be, and that's not even taxed right yeah that's yeah that's without right. right. yeah. housing subsidies well let me right. let me say Food two things subsidies. one Help two things you. um thank you Brenda she posted Wow, she posted your article, The Correlation Between Crime, Violence, and Poverty in Westchester County. Everybody needs to reread that. And she just posted, watch the latest episode of The Greaves of Freedom with Sandy Barnaby oh, thank you. at the McSilver <laughs> Institute <laughs> of Poverty yeah. Policy yeah. and Brenda's Research. Yeah, yeah, so, <laughs> so she's sharing all that. And tell now, her to post the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. She, said, she said, please, Brenda, can you post 
a link to Michelle Alexander's book, The yes. New Jim Crow. Oh, yeah. Now, now what everybody's been talking about, and again, briefly, you're going, you you're running for office, yeah, and, and and over the Mount Vernon area, mm-hmm. what? And you heard some of the complaints that we just said. Right. What are you, if elected, right. going to do about it? Well, or, that, that's, or, yeah. mm-hmm. well that's, that's what we've been talking about. I mean, I think we have a good understanding of what the community needs. When Astorino, who has not, I believe, been a friend to Mount Vernon, uh, tried to pull away the subsidies for daycare centers, uh, the, for the families who are working class families receiving subsidies for daycare centers, we fought against them. When they were trying to shut down Mount Vernon Hospital, we fought against them. So the whole idea is to know that you have a fighter that's going to be in Albany seeking to make sure that we have the subsidies in place, seems to make sure that we transform our community, that we have the affordable housing subsidy that we need in order to build our community, that we have the money for after school programs for our young people, that we have uh, safety nets in our community to protect people from false evictions and and other um, uh, other plagues that plague our community we, we we're going we're seeking to do the stuff that we have been doing but on another level that will bring resources back to our community and when you look at our record it is clear that we've been fighting we need memorial field built by now we've been fighting for that for years something something is wrong there that's actually how I met you <laughs> that's actually how I met you yeah. in the beginning of Black West that's Chester, right. in June of 2014 that's right you had a unity community rally or something, right? Where y'all were marching, march for, through the streets, marching, marching for Memorial Field. That's right, march. For I went Memorial to do Field. a story just to cover it. Hey. I had been in Georgia for 10, 12 years, and you know, I use this example. You know, when your child, you don't see your child grow, it's growing a little bit every day, but the person who hasn't seen your child for six right. months or a year or five years goes, "Wow, they've grown." Well, the same way in reverse. Since I had not been here for twelve years. The, the deterioration everybody seen daily when I came back yo I wanted to cry that day like <laughs> I was just going to write a regular piece I ended up writing a big editorial calling out all the politicians which is how I met you Richard Thomas and everybody else right. wanted to talk to me after that article so yeah. it was it was your your rally that, that, that uh, kicked that yeah, off in one we, of the first big Black Westchester articles yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a shame, but it's, it's still actually you hit condition. me too. On you was like, yes, I, thank you, Mister. Yeah, yeah, you right. Because I said you're the one who. Because before that, we had articles written against us for trying to push for that, and then you I were the first believe, one that I, wrote a good article. And I, but, I but said, I, oh, who is I this still, guy? I still agree with Damon. <laughs> I still agree with Damon when yeah. he says he lived in Greenberg and he didn't ever have to march to have his parks repaired. Mm. I don't think that's something we should have to march for. Yeah, I agree. You, you understand what I'm saying? Like, I lived too. in Long Island for a while, like he just said. Yeah. When the when the backboard was broken, right. it sometimes took a little longer than Greenberg, but it, like right. a couple of days later, it was fixed. Right. When certain things were broken. My, my parents never marched for any, right. you know what and I'm saying, field when I lived in After Long we Island. marched for 4th Street Park, then they released the money. We did the same thing for 4th Street Park. It was in ruins. Then so whatever conflict was going on in the city, we brought attention to it, and they were able to release the money and get something fixed over there. And and now it looks it looks much better. But um, you know, I, I still believe in the times of you know marching. You know what? Even, even, with, even with that, that was you know, a campaign attention. strategy that was released just just before the yeah. primary. I mean, that's and if yeah. and if it wasn't a primary in the mayor race, that, that probably wouldn't have been, been fixed. I mean, I'm either. just keeping it real. But so right. so um, I want to give. You two, last words, wrap up. Um, we got we started ten minutes, like about ten minutes. Um, um, anything I didn't ask y'all, um, how people can get in touch with you or or have access to it? Would you know? Is there anything people can read online where you've um, published or? I, I want um, Sandy Burnaby to talk about the work of uh, three local women who are uh, doing research based on my work. Okay. And, and that that's up. Tanya Thompson. You can pull the mic to you, too. It, Tanya it, 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 Thompson. No, you can pull it. it, it, it oh, yeah. yeah, there you go. There Tanya you go. Thompson, okay? okay. Uh, with the Westchester Coalition for Police Reform. And I hope that you can get her on and, yeah, uh, and well, have her set, interview. Yeah. If you set it, set up, it up, make it happen. Whatever Sunday. Set it up. And, the, and my final Sunday. words always is that if we're going to undo racism, we need to have a common education around this so that we all have a, a common analysis that we have to deal with the structures and the policies that drive the pain and suffering. I, I encourage everybody to go to the website antiracistalliance.com and go register for a workshop. And from there we work together as a collective, a growing base of anti-racists in Westchester County 
making changes that are structural and long lasting. Right. And I wonder Thank I wonder um, I'm posting a link from your from your ad. Um, I wanted to ask and I never did ask you what is the anti racist alliance? The Why was that started? How how that come okay, about? You what you do for them? Well, the anti racist alliance started back in uh, like 15 years ago, actually. And we were social workers, but it doesn't have to be social workers. We're human service workers who said, you know, we're, we're trained to deliver services, we're trained to help people, but we didn't have an analysis of how we were enablers to the system that would drive the pain and suffering. We did the Undoing Racism workshop, we got this analysis, and we, underst we understand that while we're delivering services and helping people that we have to also be politicized and we have to organize for structural change. So the Anti-Racist Alliance is um, an organizing arm for the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond in this area. And in the past 12 years, we've brought 15,000 people through the Undoing Racism Workshop. And you can't go into a school of social work now or a human service agency without people understanding now, while we deliver services, we have to have a structural analysis of why people are poor and that we have to deal with the systems, the structural mm -hmm. arrangements. So that's what the Alliance is. Okay. Graduates of the Undoing Racism Workshop. And that website is a place where people can go to find each other with monthly meetings, find resources, find the calendar of workshops. Okay. It, it's a it's a it's a virtual movement, right? The Undoing Racism Movement, we need a place to go. And I just want to say for anybody who does not know, Every place that I have been, basically, in Westchester County, whether it was marching for this or protesting for this or doing... I, yo, I ain't see a lot of people, but Kenneth Chamberlain's always out there somewhere. This young lady right here is always out there somewhere. I mean, everywhere. Like, you, she's always there. She's... Like, a lot of people talk. We got a lot of my brothers and sisters talk about the, 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 the trials and tribulations we face, and they won't speak up. And this lady here is always out, and she's always on the front well, line. And you. I just want to put that out there. Thank you, AJ. And there are so, so many others, right? When well, we, there, right. there are others. Oh there, there, are, there are a lot of others. I and mean, and I was surprised when I went to... Even we went to the thing in the city. Remember the thing where... Um, uh, at the DOJ or something yeah, with, yes, yes, with, yes. With, with Molly's mom and dad right. and all yes. yo I was like this is the first time I was like yo there's a whole lot of white people here that's holding right. up signs <laughs> and, and when I went to Eric Garner when you was out of town that's and right. Cynthia took me to Eric Garner's funeral uh, right. I'm seeing white people talking about stop the racism and yo stop <laughs> killing black people and right, you know, there's such and such communist party of such and such I was like right. what the hell because I had never seen that that white people are getting clear about what, what our <laughs> right. role is in, yeah. in, in cleaning up the mess that we've created mm. um, a, a couple of a couple of comments Real quick, um, Nichelle Johnson, Judge Nichelle Johnson said, "Teach, we struggle to afford college to tuition." I guess when we was talking about that, right. Montika Jones said, "I worked double shift three days a week, four years for four years to pay for my daughter's college tuition. It was a struggle." Um, yep. So uh, yeah, I saw it. And, I've been there. And, and, and brother <laughs> Arthur, there. I posted. They had a, a challenge where you posted what made you a, a pl proud black man or whatever. Yeah. And I posted a, a outfit of me in the African. Brother Arthur said I was expected. I I was expecting you to wear that Afri that white African outfit. <laughs> so he, <laughs> so he, you know, I guess you know what what we're talking about. So, um, shout to everybody who's listening, Damon. Um, wrapping it up. Any yeah, I just want to so. you know I want to thank um, Brother Buford for for coming on the show a second time. Thank you. And 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 gracing us and with any time you were yeah, in New, New York. York yeah, yeah. Consider the, the this studio open. home. Yeah. Like for real, I'm, yeah. I'm 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 here Sunday. Uh, y'all yeah. got yo, just let me know and we'll uh, kick somebody off the show. It's just no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> brother, um, brother Moraine, you know, thank you for coming on. Thank and, you for inviting and, and let people and Sandy always. Um, and you know, this open door for you. Yes, it's, you, it's really. open door. I also want to. Um, this week I spoke at the PDC. I got the T-shirt on. PDC uh, Foundation uh, Basketball Clinic. It was good to talk to the young men and women um, there. Um, I spoke to them this week, and um, I remind everybody, um, November 16th to the 20th, you have uh, what what is labeled as um, uh, uh, the 2016 Black Power Conference. Um, the Black Family, the Black Family Summit, is being in Newark. Um, you could go on um, Institute of the Black World, 21st Century, and. Um, and and get all and get all the information. If you uh, can't find it. There's a big article. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. There's a big Black article in the front of Black it's Westchester. It's the highlighted. Area. It's hosted by um, Mayor Baraka, the son of um, Amiri Baraka, 
and it's, it's, it's going to be it's going to be it's going to be real great. We got some more information. I posted a lot of stuff uh, live on Facebook from the meeting yesterday. Um, yes. They're going to be giving awards to Chuck D and Sister Soldier. Oh, it's good to meet see her. I haven't seen yeah, her in see years. Sister Soldier came out. Um, Doctor Professor Jeffries. Yeah, it's always uh, a, the pleasure yeah, it's, to see her. It's him. always good to to be around him. Um, so um, really, you know that's that, that's what we're looking forward to November. They they have it every four years after the president election. Discuss on the conditions of, of of black people throughout the diaspora and 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 pan and and pan Africa. So so that's is is really you know it's really going to be a big one. Um, it's really going to be a big one. It's, they confirmed Minister Farrakhan is going to do the breakfast. Oh, so they did confirm. Yeah, they, I know they were trying Minister to confirm. Farrakhan is going to close it out. All right. Um, they're going to talk about reparations and and different issues. Um, they they say reparations is 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 not off the table, so so that's going to be a great discussion to see to, to see how that go. That's, um, that's what's up. Go ahead. Also, uh, teespring dot com. Put in the search, Black Westchester. Brenda uh, has already posted it for you too. What the, oh. the, the, the shirt? The, the, oh, the oh, oh, for the t shirt. Yeah, yeah. yeah, she. I can't even keep up with her. Um, <laughs> Uh, for the T-shirts, um, twenty-two dollars, thirty percent goes to to mentoring programs. Um, we definitely want to help out the boys and men mentoring program, and, and, and then go on to be able to help others too. But yeah, that, that's, yeah, yeah, that, yeah but that's that, the one that, we've that been working one that with. We've been yeah, that, that we on. have we de- definitely been focused on, um, and and whatever programs we could come around. But um, you know, twenty-two dollars, you know, it is it's it's not bad. We got men's men shirts and women shirts, and it just it just costs twenty-two dollars. So. Other than that, um, we don't have nothing scheduled coming up, I don't think. So we got so Thursday. We supposed to be at Yosemite. Oh Yosemite, man, the, the park, yeah, at the park. <laughs> and, you was, and you was there last Thursday. How was it last Thursday? Yo, it was great. Um, Grammy Award women um, um, Bilal um, performed. It was a tribute to um, it was a tribute to Earth, Wind, and Fire. Um, this Thursday, we're gonna have Angie Johnson is 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 going to perform. She's gonna close it out. And we gotta uh, bring her back on the show. Yeah, too. yeah. She was Good on the show fun. earlier and she performed. Y'all could go and um, um, y'all could go and pull that up. Brenda Crump. I should have told you earlier. You could have pulled up the performance. But um, you know, it's gonna be a great thing. You know, it's where gonna be that? a great thing. Where, where di- is it's, that? It's in Yosemite Park. Um, it's the Bill Carter. They named it after Bill Carter. Right. Okay. It's the Bill Carter uh, jazz, Summer jazz, Summer Jazz, jazz Festival. Festival. And Green, um, that's Greenberg, right? Yeah, it's Greenberg. Greenberg. Yosemite Park and Greenberg, right behind the Greenberg Center. So yeah. the the park that's right behind the Greenberg Center. Um, Thursday is the fi- is, is the final night for it, and Angie Johnson will be performing. And it's, I'm, I'm telling you, you know, I've, I've known Angie Johnson. Her husband is a long, uh, close friend of mine, and they're, they're a friend of the show. They've been on the show, and she's going to put on a, a beautiful show, and it's free. It's free for everybody. Three ninety nine. That's everybody. Right. So you. nobody has no excuses. <laughs> Yo. So <laughs> they got Chef Alamine. They got Booth. Chef Alamine is up there. It's, it's it's great. It's 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 a nice uh it's a nice event. Beautiful shout, event. Shout shout to Janine Bedsock Stillman, who you know better, who you know Damon. At, better as Ginger from the UN, the UN United. Oh, oh, uh, hey she, hey hey she's Ginger. Tuned in. I hope you was listening. Yeah, There's a lot of information. Yeah, she's tuned in. Um, shout out to everybody who's listening. We'd like to thank our guests. Um, you could be doing anything else, but you decided to ride with us. Did I get all the com- all the shout outs in? Do we any announcements? We don't have no more announcements, right? No, that's it. Your thing is tomorrow. Right. That's Thursday. Thursday. Um, no, I right. can't think of anything else coming up, but just stay tuned to Black Westchester. Um, again, like you said about the T-shirts. If you advertise in the classified ad section. In the month of August, it's three hundred dollars for the year to advertise your business or organization. That's twenty five dollars a month. Um, if you advertise in the month of August, thirty percent of what you uh, of, of of that advertising will also go to um, the Cecil Parker, Cecil H. Parker Boys and Men Mentoring Program. So that should be an incentive for y'all to come out and advertise in that section in the month of August. Um, as always, you. Um, could be doing anything else, but you decide to ride with us, and we greatly appreciate it. You've been listening to Black Westchester Presents, People Before Politics radio show every Sunday, 6 to 8, on InTheMixRadio.com. And until next week... You will not be able to stay home, brother. You will not be able to stay home.
will not be able to plug in, turn on, and cop out. You will not be able to lose yourself on stag and skip out for beer during commercials because the revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by Xerox in four parts without commercial interruptions. The revolution will not show you pictures of Nixon blowing a bugle and leading a charge by John Mitchell, General Abrams, and Spiro Agnew to eat hog moths confiscated from the Harlem sanctuary. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by the shape of a war theater and will not star Natalie Woods and Steve McQueen or Bullwinkle and Julia. The revolution will not give your mouth sex appeal. The revolution will not get rid of the nub. The revolution will not make you look five pounds thinner because the revolution will not be televised, brother. There will be no pictures of you and Willie Mae pushing that shopping cart down the block on the dead run or trying to slide that color TV into a stolen ambulance. NBC will not be able to predict the winner at 8.32 on the court from 29 districts. The revolution will not be televised. There will be no pictures of pigs shooting down brothers on the instant replay. There will be no pictures of pigs shooting down brothers on the instant replay. There will be no pictures of Whitney Young being run out of Harlem on the rail with a brand new process. There will be no slow motion or still life of Roy Wilkins strolling through Watts in a red, black, and green liberation jumpsuit that he has been saving for just the proper occasion. Acres, Beverly Hillbillies, and Hooterville Junction will no longer be so damn relevant, and women will not care if Dick finally got down with Jane on Search for Tomorrow, because black people will be in the street looking for a brighter day. The revolution will not be televised. There will be no highlights on the 11 o'clock news and no pictures of Harry R. Uh, women liberationists and Jackie Onassis blowing her nose. The theme song will not be written by Jim Webb or Francis Scott Key, nor sung by Glenn Campbell. Tom Jones, Johnny Cash, Engelbert Humperdinck, or the rare earth, the revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be right back after a message about a white tornado, white lightning, or white people. You will not have to worry about a dove in your bedroom, the tiger in your tank, or the giant in your toilet bowl.